inside the heart, there are details. We've talked about, you know, whenever we, whenever we talk about the heart, we talk about the, the chambers, the ventricles, the valves and that sort of thing. But I mean, the details, the ridges, the lumps and bumps, all of these things have got names. And I tend to forget their names because I don't teach this very often. So I thought if I make a video about it, maybe I'll remember their names. So let's, let's do that. Let's look at the details inside the heart some of which you may well have met before and some of which you uh, may not. Uh, we should probably start where the blood goes into the right atrium and, and there are a lot of features in the right atrium. I guess the most uh, famous one is the that oval depression there, the fossa ovalis. So the fossa ovalis is what we see in the adult heart or the heart after birth um, and this is what's left of the foramen ovale the foramen ovale in the heart um, it's a <laughs> it's an oval hole in the fetus it's a flat valve so in the in the fetus when in the uterus the lungs are still growing and the lungs are not the site of gaseous exchange the placenta is so blood comes in from the placenta through the uh, umbilical vein and that blood eventually gets into the inferior vena cava and flows into the right atrium. Now, um, because the lungs are growing, um, not a lot of blood can flow through the lungs. So there are alternate routes by which the blood can flow directly from the right side of the heart to the left. Ways of avoiding the lungs, right? And then this one, the foramen ovale, it's a one-way flap valve. So it can flap and open that away, so move from right to left, but if you push it from left to right, it'll close against the interatrial septum, which is what we're seeing there. We can see the foramen ovale in the right atrium, and we can also see the foramen ovale in the left atrium. Um, so that hopefully gives you an idea of where the interatrial septum is. Now, uh, what happens is that, uh, sure, during the fetal period, blood flows from the right atrium to the left atrium, left ventricle, aorta, off around the body. It's avoided the lungs. Great. Um, but with the first breath, the lungs fill with air. Loads of blood flows to the lungs for that gaseous exchange to occur, which means that a huge amount of blood flows back into the left atrium from the lungs more blood means more pressure. Now the pressure in the left atrium is higher than in the right atrium. So that pushes that flat valve of the foramen ovale closed um, and blood can no longer flow from the right atrium to the left atrium. And then over time that will seal up. Although in 25% of people it doesn't. About a quarter of people, your, your foramen ovale probably would still flap, but it never will because the pressure of blood in the left atrium will always be highest, so will always be kept functionally closed anyway. Um, the foramen ovale has a, a raised edge. Uh, the limbus fossa ovalis is that raised edge. In fact, another feature we can see there, do you see how in the right atrium there is a curve? Uh, so if that's the inferior vena cava coming in there, there's a curving shape. Um, this is the eustachian valve, yes, named after Professor Eustachio. There are other things in the body named for Professor Eustachio too. Um, it, it, I think its modern name is the valve of the inferior vena cava. It's not really a valve, but that, that, that curving shape directs that blood that comes in through the inferior vena cava flows it around and directs it through the foramen ovale in the fetus. So that, that shape is a remnant of the fetal circulation as well. Uh, the other thing we can see inside the red, right atrium is that some of it is smooth and some of it is ridged. Um, the ridged is the pectinate muscle and uh, is, is bands of cardiac muscle forming those shapes. Now the reason there's a smooth bit and a ridged bit is again in the embryo the atria form from a single atrium and the sinus venosus now the sinus venosus is pairs of veins bringing blood into the embryonic heart and the sinus venosus and the atrium 
will both come together to form the atria and then they'll get divided into the two atria. So the smooth bit is the bit that formed from the sinus venosus. The, uh, the ridgy bit is the bit that formed from that single embryonic atrium. And um, there is another... So where the um, smooth bit meets the ridged bit, that's the crista terminalis, the terminal crest. Um, so crista terminalis is where the, the sinus venosus becomes the atrium. Of course, now in the adult heart, it's all atrium. Um, that being the oracle, the oracle's part of the atrium. So um, yes, these the ridges that we see in here, that is um, cardiac muscle arranged into ridges, maybe it gives you an indication of how it contracts. Um, and these ridges are called, like I say, the pectinate muscle or the musculi pectinati. Um, yeah. the, other thing, the other thing we can see in the right atrium, we can see um, a, red, a red round hole in there. Uh, that is the opening of the coronary sinus. Oh, more confusion. There are other coronary sinuses. This is the coronary sinus that collects blood from the cardiac veins. So the coronary arteries supply blood to the muscle of the heart. Um, the, the blood, the venous blood then from the muscle of the heart is collected in the cardiac veins. Those cardiac veins drain their blood to the coronary sinus, the coronary sinus that's back here. That coronary sinus is now carrying deoxygenated blood, so it seems very sensible to put it back into the right atrium because then that deoxygenated blood will go to the lungs and become well oxygenated blood and go off around the body. So the opening of the coronary sinus, how are we doing? I think that's probably all, all the atrium stuff. And then if we move from the atrium into the ventricle, um, I'm not really gonna talk about the valves because we talk about the valves when we talk about general heart anatomy and here we're adding a bit more detail. Um, but of course, this is an atrioventricular valve because it's carrying blood from the atrium to the ventricle. The right atrioventricular valve has three leaflets or three cusps. And of course, we see the cordy tendony, the heart strings. Uh, the cordy tendony are like guy ropes. Um, when the ventricle contracts, the cordy tendony support the valve leaflets. As the leaflet gets pushed closed, that's good, stops blood going into the atrium but then the cordy tendony stop that very high pressure developed in the ventricle from blowing the valve backwards into the atrium and uh, filling the atrium with blood, which would defeat the whole purpose of the exercise, right? So we've got the cordy tendony. Now the cordy tendony attached to papillary muscles. The cordy tendony aren't very, they aren't stretchy, they're inelastic, anyway. Um, uh, and they attach to the papillary muscles. Now a papillary muscle, a papilla is like um, a projection, like a nipple. So the right atrioventricular valve has three leaflets and there are three papillary muscles. The left atrioventricular valve has two leaflets, so it has two papillary muscles. And the cordy tendony attached to these papillary muscles. So when the ventricle contracts, when the muscular wall of the ventricles contract, that papillary muscle, which is also muscle of the heart, myocardium, that contracts as well, pulls on the heart string, everything works perfectly, blood goes where it, what you want it to and doesn't go where you don't want it to. Um, now, when I say we have three leaflets and three um, papillary muscles, each leaflet does send cordy tendony. No, each papilla does receive cordy tendony from two leaflets. So it's not like you've got one leaflet, anyway. Um, and the papillary muscles are, there's an anterior one, there's a posterior one, and then there's a septal one, because this is the uh, interventricular septum here, this very thick wedge between the two ventricles. Uh, and that's on the right side. Then on the left side, those two papillary muscles are anterior and posterior. And we can see ridges in here as well, can't we? Now, the, uh, the ridges that we see in the ventricles are the trabeculi carni, carn, carnivore, I think literally meaty ridges. Um, so trabeculi carni are the ridges in the ventricles, 
pectinate muscles of the ridges in the atria. These are the words I always forget. I get them the wrong way around. Trabeculi carni. Um, and again, um, the arrangement of those ridges kind of shows you how the ventricles contract. Now, like I say, that's the um, interventricular septum there. Um, can you see this particular ridge coming around here? This gets a name. This is the moderator band. We're in the right ventricle, and from the anterior uh, papillary muscle, the moderator band is this band of muscle that runs to the interventricular septum. Um, it's kind of notable because it can be a useful landmark um, radiographically and what have you, but just anatomically, in there is the right bundle branch of the bundles of his that are carrying action potentials down to the ventricles from the atrioventricular node to cause the ventricles to contract. So the right bundle branch of the bundles of his are in, are in there. So that's the detail within the heart. Right, do I remember it any better now? Um, so we have the pectinate muscles forming the ridges in the atrium. We have the eustachian valve forming that curve. The uh, delineation between the smooth and the ridges in the atrium is the crista terminalis. We see the fossa ovalis and the opening of the coronary sinus in there. Um, and then in the ventricles, the, uh, the, the ridges are the trabeculi carnii. We have the cordy tendony, uh, the papillary muscles, the moderator band. Um, and that's probably it, right? It doesn't sound so bad now I've, now I've um, said it out loud. I think I might remember that in the future. Maybe, test me. All right, more detail about the heart. Um, always a fun organ to talk about. Right, speak to you next week. Hopefully that was useful and interesting. Hey, it was useful for me, if nobody else, right? Mm -hmm.